Hello Sharks, this is video 7, where we're going to learn our very first zone defense. We're going to learn the three-man cup. This is a classic defense that lots of teams use, and it's usually the first zone defense that any team learns. So this is what we've typically been playing with. We have each defender picking a particular attacker and covering them. They're staying right with them, and they're moving wherever they move on the field. This can create a lot of unnecessary running. So if, you're if your attacker just decides to run in circles, you have to follow him running in circles. So what we can do is, instead of trying to lock down a particular player, we can try and lock down a particular space and or a particular lane, which means players will have separation, they'll be open, but it'll be hard to throw to them because there's no lane. Or they won't be able to create separation because you're clogging that space. This is what a three-man cup looks like. We have each player in their zone, in the area of the field that they are responsible for. And we're going to talk about each one of them separately, and then we'll talk about them together. The first group is the cup. There's three players. It's a three-man cup. We also have the open wing. We have the center. We have the hammer wing, or hammer stopper, or break wing, and we have the deep. We'll talk about each one of those. First we have the cup. The job of the cup is to be an even more intense marker. So the cup contains primarily our marker, and it contains two extra guys, which really don't have a name, but we'll just call them the other members of the cup. They are shutting down even more of the field than a traditional marker can by themselves. The only remaining lanes through the cup are very small, very, very narrow, very tight. Smart players don't try to make these throws. They're too difficult. If I see people on our team trying to make these throws or trying to throw through the cup, I'm going to be very upset with you. Don't do it. It's very, very difficult. So this is what the cup is trying to do. They're trying to shut down these two lanes. They're also, of course, trying to shut down the break option. In a cup, we have what's called a hand dominance. In this case, we have a force left. That means each member of our cup has a right hand dominance. They do not want the disc to pass them on their right hand side. So our marker is not going to get broken on their right hand side and our two other cup members are not going to have the disc pass them on their right hand side. Now, of course, if it comes on their left hand side, sure, you can reach for it with your left hand and try to block it, but I want you to be primarily concerned with your right hand side. <clears throat> if we had a force right situation, which is the opposite of this situation, then we would have a left hand dominance. This leaves only one main lane that's usable right here. The other important thing about the cup is that wherever the disc goes, the cup goes. If the disc is moved upfield and the cup doesn't follow it, now we suddenly have only four defenders remaining against the entire other team. Our cup has to be involved, has to be in the play. They have to get there to set up the mark. So wherever the disc goes, the cup goes. As soon as the disc leaves the handler's hands, the cup needs to be following. They need to be sprinting after that disc. doesn't matter where it's going. If it's a swing pass, if it's an upline pass, if it's a swing back the other way, or if it's a drop, the cup follows the disc, and the cup does not lollygag. The cup sprints after the disc. The next position is our open wing. Like I said with the cup, we only have one remaining usable lane. That's the open wing's job. They are shutting down that remaining lane. So, as attackers come into that lane, the open wing moves over. And, importantly, as the attackers move away, the open wing does not follow them. The open wing returns to their zone. Part of zone defense is not following defenders wherever they go. You only care about people in your zone. As soon as they leave your zone, 
They're not your problem. Don't follow them. If you do follow them, you're going to leave your zone wide open and it's going to be trouble. So if the cup moves, the open wing is going to follow it. The open wing is a little more free flowing. Sometimes the disc will move, but it won't move very much. It'll move only a couple yards, only a couple feet. And sometimes the open wing may not have to move much at all, as compared to the cup, who is moving and staying on that disc. If the disc moves two yards, the cup moves two yards. The open wing, perhaps not. But you always want to try and shut down that lane. Next is our other wing, our hammer wing or our brake wing. Our hammer wing is covering the other side of the field. They're covering the short, over-the-top, high-release elevator passes that come right over top of the marker. They're also covering the deep hammer passes. There's a little loosely defined role. The hammer wing or hammer stopper can really play anywhere in any of these positions. It's going to depend on the wind. It's going to depend on where the players are. It's going to defend, depend on how good the handler is. If you know the handler and you know that they don't have a particularly strong hammer, then play in the short zone and stop the, stop the high releases and stop the elevators. If you know that they do have a very strong hammer, you're probably going to have to stay back more and give them those high release passes because I'd rather give them a very short pass than give them a 40-yard hammer. Where I like to stand as the hammer is back here towards the sideline with my back to the sideline. That way I'm watching the whole field and I can run in any direction I want. That works for me. It's called triangular poaching. We'll talk a little bit more about it in practice. We can use it in a man-to-man -man defense setting, but it works very well in a zone defense as well. So the hammer has two different jobs. If we see a guy cutting in for the short elevator or over the top throw, the hammer can cut in short and stop them. Or if we see a guy going deep for a big hammer, the hammer can or the hammer stopper can go deep and stop them as well. Two rolls for our hammer wing. The next position is the center. The center also has two areas of concern, one of which is a much bigger concern than the other. The first area of concern is this short little area right in front of the cup, right at the very front of the stack. They're trying to stop that short elevator, that short high release pass right into the front of the stack. That short over the top pass, that's the center's problem. Secondarily, the center can cover the rest of the stack downfield most handlers are not going to be able to put the disc into this area and a lot of them aren't even going to try because it's so crowded but the center can look there as well the center's other big important job is to be the boss of the wings the center can tell the wings to play in short or play in deep and then the center will move over to help cover the slop so here we see the center has told the hammer wing to play deeper to stop those 40-yard hammers. And the center can then move over to stop the very short elevators and short over the tops. You can also have the opposite situation where the center is realizing the deep hammer isn't a very big problem. And he's telling our hammer stopper to play in short and stop those short passes while the center slides back just in case of something a little ugly coming over. We can also do it on our open side by calling our open side our open wing player in short. We'll move over to cover a little bit of his deep zone, and we can do it the other way as well. Something very important about doing this, not only for our wings but also for our center, is stay in your zone. As the center moves over to help cover either of the wings, the center is staying in their zone, is staying towards the center of the field. The center is not going to commit all the way over to a wing, and a wing is not going to commit all the way into the center. We need to stay in our zones. So we can move over towards the edges of our zones, where you'll see later that our zones overlap a little bit. But we need to stay in our zone. We can move over to help, 
but stay in your zone. The final position is the deep. The center, I said, is the boss. The deep is the center's boss, and the deep is the town crier. The deep is going to see the whole play. A lot of our attackers, a lot of the offensive players are behind our center and behind our wing. So they're not always going to be able to see when a, when a cut is being made. So our deep is going to call out where our cuts are coming from and where they're going so that our center can make decisions about who should be covering them or if they should be covered at all. The defender or the deep's job is to never shut up. Constantly call out positions of these attackers. The deep's other role is, of course, the deep plays or the deep end of the field. There are not going to be a lot of hucks coming up out of a cup. There's almost never a huck coming through a cup. The only time hucks will happen is when the cup or when the disc has been moved out of the cup and the cup is slow getting there. But when those big throws, those hucks do come up, the deep needs to stop them. The deep is our clutch player. When those big throws, when those hucks are caught, it's big trouble for our defense. So our deep needs to commit immediately to get there and to stop that play. The deep also has the largest zone of any other player. And there really isn't a, a, a set way for them to play it. There really is no... Um, no plan, nobody's come up with a good metric to do it. So it's very much up to each individual player. When we run a cup with our team, we're going to only have a few players, maybe just two players, that play as deeps. And we're just going to let them practice the position over and over again so they figure out a good way to do it for themselves. It's going to depend on their own physical abilities, it's going to depend on wind, it's going to depend on the opposing handlers. There are tons and tons of variables that each individual deep player is going to have to analyze and decide where they need to be. So we're not going to have very many players in that position. We're also not going to have many players in the center position because it is a boss position. We'll leave our experienced players in the center. Our newer players are probably going to be in the cup or as wings. So let's see what happens when we have players attacking deep. First we're going to show one of our attackers cutting in. Our open side wing has moved over to cut him off. Good play, smart play. The deep has already yelled that that guy is cutting in short. The defender, or our defender on our open wing knows to move in and cut him off. Good play. Now he's starting to pull back and he's starting to go deep. Our defender, our open wing, is going to follow him towards the end, the edge of the open wing zone. And now the deep needs to call them off. So the deep is going to say, leave him, or he's going to say, I've got him, or he's going to say something to tell the open wing to stop covering that guy. And it's now the deep's problem. Once a player has left your zone, or once another player has called you off of someone, return to your zone. Let the other player deal with them. So much in zone defense is knowing what is and what is not your problem. If someone calls you off of a player, or if a player leaves your zone, they are no longer your problem. Here's another instance where a player starts by cutting deep. Our deep defender has moved over to stop him. Now he's coming in short towards the break side. Our deep is going to notify our hammer wing that he's coming in, that we have a player attacking that side, and our hammer wing can now move over to cover him. Our center might call the deep or the hammer wing off of this player and might want our hammer wing to stay short. That's fine. So the deep is going to tell him that this guy is coming, and the center is going to call him off if the center wants it. If the center doesn't want it, we're going to let our hammer wing attack that player and our center can move over to cover the overlap. So here we have all of our positions laid out and we're going to show what our zones look like. Our wing has a very short zone 
on the open side of the field. They're covering swing passes. They're covering primarily short upline passes. Those little 20 yard passes that come out of the stack so often. That's the open wings problem. Our hammer wing is covering almost the entire break side. They have a lot to cover, but they have a little bit longer to get there because the passes are going to be uglier. The center is going to be moving the hammer wing much more than they move the open wing because the open wing's job is a little bit more set in stone while the hammer wing's job is a little bit more loosely defined. The center has the smallest area to cover and if you look at that you'll notice that the area of his zone which doesn't overlap into a wing zone is incredibly small. It's because the hammer or the center doesn't really stop the disc that often. The center's job is to be the boss and to be the overlap. To move the wings and then to move in to help cover where the wings are not. That's the center's job. Our largest zone is the deep. We've already talked about the deep calling out players attacking and the deep doing kind of their own system to cover their zone. The cup, their zone is very small. It's about the size of a frisbee. The cup follows the disc. The cup doesn't care where the wings are. Cup doesn't care where the center is. Cup doesn't care where the deep is. Cup follows the disc. That's all they do. They're like dogs. They follow the disc. They run their guts out. When the cup gets tired, we pull them out, we put another one in. That's how it works. So here's how it all moves. Here we have stack five coming out of the stack. Our deep was, missed it and didn't call him out. Or our open wing missed the block. Something bad happened. The guy got the disc. Now our defense needs to move. The disc went up the field, and the disc went to the defense's left. So, all of our defenders are going to move in that same sort of pattern. They're going to move up the field, and they're going to move to their left. First and foremost, the cup follows the disc. Secondly, we have our open wing pulling up. We have our center pulling up. We have our hammer wing pulling up. Our hammer wing may not pull up in these situations as it gets closer to the line. That's the center's problem. The center needs to tell the hammer wing whether or not to pull deep or to stay back to cover in that area where our old handlers were. The deep is also going to come up because now if there is a huck, it's probably coming down that sideline. Now, because our hammer is pulled up deep, our hammer stopper is deep, their, their drops and their swings over there are wide open, so they're going to take those options. So we now need to move back over that way. So the disc has moved back and the disc has moved to our right, so everyone is going to move accordingly. The cup follows the disc, everyone else is back and right. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to beat a cup in practice. In our next video, we're going to talk about crashes, and we're going to talk about using the cup to create what's called a line trap. That's all for now. Stay tuned to our next video.